We're live. Um, we still got ten minutes. We just I like to have the. Um,
Send it back to right yeah. He had faith. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. <coughs> well, thank you all for coming. We're going to be uh, getting started here in a couple of seconds. I hope the people in the back can hear me. Is this working good? Uh, and then to the millions out there in YouTube land who are watching, I hope you can hear as well. So thank you.
I'll turn this over to Lara. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So glad to see everybody here tonight, both in person and at home for this very exciting event. My name is Lara Villamont, she and hers. I'm the head of Outreach and Community Experience here at the Framingham Public Library. And we are so excited tonight to feature an author event celebrating Naval historian James Horn Fisher and his most recent novel, Who Can Hold the Sea? Before we get things started, since it is so close to Veterans Day intentionally, I wanted to take a moment of silence both for those who are here with us who have served and those who are not. All right, thank you again. Um, we are so thrilled to feature tonight Dave Hornfisher, Jim's father, and Chris Newton, the narrator and longtime friend of Jim of the new book. So I'll turn things over to them in just a moment. Before we do, a few brief announcements. At this point, would you please make sure that your cell phones have all been silenced? Ringers, alarms, texts, emails, anything like that, go ahead and turn those off for me. Uh, we have about 40, 45 minutes worth of a presentation from Dave and Chris, and then we will take some time at the end for questions. I wanted to preempt one of those questions. Unfortunately, today we do not have any books for sale, but we do have them at the library. So if you have a library card, we encourage you to check them out. They're also available for purchase through your local Barnes & Noble or on Amazon. Um, we do have an evaluation form on the back table there. We would love to hear from you what you thought about tonight's event. Do you have any ideas for future events? And if you'd like to join our mailing list, if you have not already, of course, we are the library, so the only thing we will ever do is send you more free information about cool programs. And of course, thanks as always to the friends of the Framingham Public Library, without whom events like this could not happen. And with that, it is my pleasure to welcome to the library, Dave Hornfisher. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Wow, an almost capacity crowd here tonight. This is bigger than you might get. I won't go on to that. Um, but this is wonderful to see so many family, friends, and friends of the library here tonight uh, for, for what I hope is a, uh, for uh, me anyway, an, an inspirational presentation. I hope for you a historical one. And I hope for others uh, a fun one, because we'll try and uh, um, really do some interesting stuff. I'm Dave Hornfisher, and as Laura said, this is Chris Newton. Chris was uh, Jim's uh, brother of sorts, I guess, when we lived in Litchfield, Connecticut, and Jim was in high school. The two, uh, two of them were inseparable, and uh, even since then, they, they, they lived in New York for a while. And uh, in the front row, I've got Jim's mother, uh, Elsa, right here with the black jacket, and Jim's uh, sister, Amy, and her husband, Andy, and grandson, Jacob. So we're represent, well represented by generations of family here as we go back to the I think, see, let's see, a lot of Jim's stuff happened right around the time I was born. So I guess we, there's a little currency in, in, in some of what I'm going to say, although I don't remember any of it. Anyway, uh, so, 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 so let's get started. Uh, who was this guy, Jim Hornfisher? A handsome young man, uh, as you can see, he looked just like his mother. Uh, he got his brains from his father and his good looks from his mother. Or was it the other way around? I'm not sure. A little of both, I think. Uh, but uh, here's a little better description of who uh, James David Hornfisher was. He was born in 1965 in Salem Hospital, where uh, Elsa was working at the time as a nurse. We lived in Swampscott. We subsequently moved to Amherst and then on to Litchfield, Connecticut, where he graduated from high school and knew Chris. Uh, he went on to Colgate University and then uh, a publishing career in, in New York City before moving on to Texas. And we'll have a little more detail on all that. But, he really is an acclaimed World War II naval historian. Lots of people have called him the dean of naval historians, and I think even though I'm his father and proud of it, uh, I don't think that's an understatement. He was both an author of a number of books, and we're gonna be talking about one tonight. Copies of uh, all of his other books are on the back there, and you'll hear Jim tell us a little bit about him a little later. Uh, he was the winner of the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award twice, actually, once from the New York Admiralty, and then once again in Boston. We'll hear a little bit about that later. And his biggest honor was getting the U.S. Navy's Distinguished Public Service Award in 2021, probably less than a month before he passed away from glioblastoma brain cancer. It's a, not a diagnosis any of us want to hear. He fought it for 18 months valiantly, uh, but uh, you know nobody wins that fight. But he did get this award, which I'm told is the highest award the Navy gives to a civilian. So we were super honored as parents. Uh, this is sort of the reason why he did a collection of uh, a number of his books, and we'll touch on a couple of them a little later. But uh, we're here tonight to talk about 
who can hold the sea, the last book that he wrote, he had it about probably 90% done before this brain cancer really began to uh, take the, uh, begin to impact him. His wife, uh, Sharon, and uh, some people at the, at the publisher uh, worked to kind of clean up the last chapters and put the whole thing together and, uh, and get it out. And it's, uh, it's been well reviewed and well received as you might expect of all his works. But uh, let's go back to the beginning. Where, did the, where does a boy who was six feet, six inches tall, over almost 300 pounds, and uh, be, begat a son who was even taller than him, and a son and a daughter as well. But uh, uh, wh where did he begin? Okay, let, 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 let's take it from the start. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim kind of liked books right from the be very beginning. Uh, Elsa and I might tell you that he knew his alphabet before he could walk. He was just curious about everything, and he especially liked books. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the immediate family of Jim and me and Elsa and Amy. Uh, Amy was adopted when Jim was four years old, so he had to learn to fight fights with, an older, with a younger sister. <laughs> and she's here with fewer battle scars, probably. Uh, through high school, through Jim's high school years, he was an avid player of Dungeons and Dragons and Risk. And uh, the, the eager player on the left who was about to be wiped out by Jim was Chris Newton over here. And, Chris, Chris humbly survives to, to, to this day. Um, he went, as I mentioned, he went on to Colgate. Um, the joke was you didn't get into Dartmouth either uh, among freshmen, uh, but he got there. He uh, joined the marching band right, right away, and uh, even though he was built like a basketball player and a football player, it was safer in the band, I guess. I don't know. He became the editor of the student newspaper. He started a science fiction magazine took his first two jobs in New York City as a, uh, as a gopher in the publishing industry where they called you an assistant editor. He, uh, he, as, he, as he copied stuff, he read it, got to know stuff, and next thing you know, he was on his way to uh, starting a literary agency in Austin, Texas, where, uh, where his, uh, his lovely wife Sharon happened to be from. You can take the girl out of Texas, but you can't take the Texas out of the girl, I guess, and so she, they moved back to Texas and had a lovely 25-year life in Texas and uh, raising uh, three wonderful children. There's a picture of, uh, the, of Sharon and Jim and they, the, the go, David, the oldest one, is in the, in the center. Hutch, the tall one, is the youngest one. He's at, uh, a senior at Southwestern. And Grace Ann is a just recent honors graduate of the University of Texas. David graduated from Arkansas. So that whole gang then in Texas kind of took over from the New England gang. And along with, uh, with, with, with this guy, turned that uh, handsome guy I showed in the beginning to this very smart looking uh, professional, uh, I guess I would character, uh, a literary agent. And, uh, as a literary agent, he, was, uh, he, had a, he had a wide number of successes. The first one, which was a, first one was, was really a book about Selena, the, the Tejano folk singer, the Tejano singer who became very famous. But uh, Flags of Our Fathers, uh, James Bradley, the, uh, whose father was one of the flag raisers at Iwo Jima, sent Jim a letter. He was, he'd been turned down by about 20 agents and publishers and said, I've got to get my story told. Jim said, I don't, Jim said, well, he says, uh, I, I, I can't say no to you. Let's do it. He saw some of Bradley's writing and wasn't exactly dazzled by it. So he put Bradley in touch with Ron Powers. You might recognize that name as somebody who was on the Sunday morning TV show on CBS, and Ron actually was the was the what was the writer behind a Ted Kennedy bio just after Ted's death, and was also the also a lover and writer about Mark Twain. He's a, he's a great writer. If you ever have a chance to read any of his stuff, he's uh, terrific. Jim did did that one. He did countless others. Uh, just to mention one other, which was which drew a fair amount of fame, was a, a lot of his books ended up being about the military. He had a he, uh, he got more and more interested in that as his, as his literary career went on as an agent. And D David Bellavia uh, was the proud author of this book. He also was a winner of a Medal of Honor, which was presented to him at a lovely ceremony at, at the White House in, uh, not too long ago with, uh, with Jim in attendance and, and Grace Ann, the daughter, was also there. So that's, um, that's kind of a thumbs, that's a sketch quickly gone through. And, uh, well, less than 10 minutes of a life that lived 55 years. Let, let's get into some of the more details about some of the books and talk a little bit about um, Jim the writer and Jim the naval historian. This picture of a submarine is uh, there is sort of an example. And I'm going to turn the, the podium over to Chris here, who's going to give an example of, of some of Jim's action writing. He loved to go into the archives of the, at the, in Washington, the Naval Archives, 
and find uh, battle reports written by people who were right in the fight and, and take these and read them and take pictures of them and bring home a camera with hundreds and hundreds of photos and, then, and, and notes from these battle reports. And so Chris is going to, um, is, is going to read you an example of, of one of the action reports that, that, that's, that's in the uh, Who Can Hold the Sea book. So turn, turn it over to Chris Newton. Uh, Jim certainly enjoyed, through all of his books, uh, writing about the action uh, of service. And it wasn't always war action, because action took place uh, uh, throughout a military career and training, etc. And the piece that I'm going to read to you, um, it exemplifies this. It's a, it's a non-wartime battle uh, action where uh, two diesel engine subs were commissioned right after World War II ended. They were the Kachino and the Tusk. And they were enlisted to, sim to simulate patrols off of the Norwegian coast to see how the submarines would uh, perform in Arctic cold weather conditions, cold water conditions, um, should the need to put a blockade up in the northern Atlantic uh, to block uh, Soviet ships were necessary. <clears throat> and Jim writes, just about noon, as Worthington closed to within a few miles of the submerged Cochino, zigzagging and tracking her with passive sonar, another message came from Benitez over the underwater telephone. Casualty, surfacing. This was a shocker. In seas this rough, a submarine captain did not lightly depart the safe haven of the depths. Benson looked at Worthington caught his eye and mouthed a dreaded word, gas. The skipper nodded in agreement. And no sooner had Captain Benitez shouted, hydrogen, put out the smoking lamp, pull no switches, than his submarine was seized by an explosion. And as fire spread in the after battery compartment, smoke and heat welled. The door swung open and men rushed out, crowding into the control room. Poisonous smoke swirled in behind them until the door was slammed shut again. Benitez shouted down the hatch from the conning tower to the control room, stand by to surface. Swiftly, the acknowledgement came. All vents shut, sir. Both plants running, ready to surface. And as the captain triggered the alarm calling, surface, 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 high pressure air rushed into the main ballast tanks shoving out water in the bow planes were angled to full rise. The violence of motion inside the Kachino was unmistakable as she rose from the waves. She broached the surface, bow, surface bow first at a high angle, then slumped level. Feet set holding fast, Benitez spun open the hatch overhead and climbed from the conning tower to the bridge, greeted the squalls with his quartermaster, Joseph Stroh's alongside, the wind whipping cold through rain and freezing seawater into their faces, and at intervals the waves crashed against the hull, washing them in spray. <clears throat> Lieutenant J.G. Frank Clifford came to the conning tower and shouted up to Benitez that the smoke had overcome several of the crew. The captain ordered all hands topside, tying open the conning tower hatch as the crew began to rise. Clifford wondered how dozens of men would fit into this tiny space of the bridge and the slick steel of the weather deck, but the captain was brooking no delays. Get them up here and on the lee side of the sail, and lively, he told Clifford. Commander Worthington needed 40 minutes to bring the tusk to the surface and close to within sight of the Kachino through the squalls and high wind. He was greeted with a disturbing visual message from the stricken sub. Man overboard, dead ahead. Fire in the after battery. The rescue of Joseph Morgan was the work of several men who saw a shipmate in extremis and did not hesitate to go there themselves. Seeing Morgan floundering, Chief Torpedoman 
Hubert Rauch of Jamaica, Queens, climbed down from the weather bridge, removing his clothes as he went and dived into the water. It was 10 minutes out and back, and by the time Rauch was nearing the sub again, with Morgan under an arm, he was too weak to keep his grip. Freezing seawater drained the strength from giants. The two men struggled. Another sailor, Clarence Balthrop, the ship's cook, jumped in and began swimming toward Morgan, while five others formed a human chain and pulled Rausch up on deck. At that moment, the largest explosion yet rocked the Kachino. Now this ordeal of the Kachino and the Tusk goes on for two chapters in the book. And it interweaves strategy and tactics and action and the relevance of those submarines being there uh, in the big picture of that time. And you'll note Jim mentions a lot of names in, in his narrative. And he was very good about that, wanting to give credit where credit was due to the servicemen who served and whenever possible would get firsthand accounts of those involved in those situations. Thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, Jim's use of words like slick and steel, you know, it just reminds me of hearing he and Ron Powers, a writer I mentioned before, when Jim was first getting writing, Ron, Ron said, he's, you, know, you know, don't just say that someone was eating a hot dog, make him feel the taste of the mustard. And uh, Jim quoted um, the Boston hi historian, uh, famous Boston historian whose name escapes me, he's so famous, um, who, who once said to, uh, who, once, who, who once read, you know, you, you can have facts like the king died and the queen died, but if you said the king died of a broken heart, you're telling a story. And Jim's books are just filled with that kind of mindset of, of writing. And, uh, you know, that's all behind kind of uh, the types of stuff that, that, that led him to uh, get some of the awards that he did. And one of the ones that uh, Elsa and I were certainly most proud of and th that we were present at was, was when he received the uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison Award a few years back on the, uh, on the decks of, or in the, in the uh, museum, I should say, got, and then he got it here on the decks of the USS Constitution with the, with the commander of the ship and the head of the uh, museum library, Ayn Rand, and uh, the chairman of the board of the museum. And uh, rather than uh, have me to ha have you just hear from Chris and, uh, Chris and I tonight, I thought you'd like to hear a few words that, uh, of Jim speaking the, the, night that he, the night that he received this award. There, there's three, three short little videos of a few minutes each. One of Jim talking about Samuel Elliott Morrison, who was a, who was a very famous uh, naval uh, historian who was named an admiral and all that. Jim was named an honorary admiral of the Texas Navy, interestingly enough, and among other quotes, things that he was given. But he, I, I think Jim knew more admirals than I know people in this room tonight. But uh, anyway, Jim got that award and we'll hear, him, well, we'll hear a little bit of that presentation as he talks about Morrison. We'll also let Jim tell you a little bit about his books. And then the third reading that, I'm have, that I've got chosen for him tonight is to talk about the uh, dropping of the atom bomb and the, about the morality be, behind it intertwined with the military strategy and the human strategy of it all. So uh, without further ado, let, let me turn the podium over to uh, Jim Hornfisher, and he's going to be getting a talk about Admiral uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison. Oh, one second. Keep... Times that the kamikazes chewed into the fleet as they did, I think you've, you've found more time. Uh, to be in places like Guam, with the Museum its headquarters, building relationships not only with admirals, but with ordinary sailors on the ships on which he served. And he used that direct experience uh, to write these, these spectacular books that Little Brown commissioned him to do, this 15 volume series known as the, US, the United States Navy in World War II, the, the definitive account of the Navy worldwide in World War II. All of which I, all of which I say to say that. Um, much as uh, Lloyd Benson said of, uh, of the great Boston president, John F. Kennedy, he says, uh, John, John F. Kennedy was a friend of mine, Senator, I knew John F. Kennedy. Sir, you're no John F. Kennedy. Well, I'm no Senator Morrison. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, and I envy him his, his opportunity to go to sea and to participate, really to put his own skin in the game, to, to really stand at risk of being blown apart by a <laughs> plunging Zeke at 400 knots from out of the clouds. I mean, he was out there. He was witnessing this terror at a time when its outcome was, was not certain. 
And so I, you know, my, my fear is that, I, is that I'm just the kind of character who writes the, the armchair histories that, uh, that he did not want to write. And I wonder, gee, what would it have been like to actually be out there as a witness and a reporter, taking it in real time? So it's an incredible um, feat that he, that he achieved, and his books are worth reading and rereading because they're works of literature. That he's been compared to Thucydides for the way he wrote from experience. Um, Edmund Morgan, the great Yale historian, compared him uh, to Thucydides. He talked about how he had the, he had the courage to simplify. So, and, and, and Morgan said that courage to simplify is is uh, especially difficult when you have a real depth of knowledge, and so you have to be able to fall back on your own judgment and become your own authority. And Morrison's works are filled with cultural and historical references, and with this courage to simplify, he's willing to be his own authority on that podium of the page. And uh, so I've tried to, I've tried to when, where I feel like it's appropriate to even try to get away with it, I try to learn from uh, Admiral Morrison. They did make him an admiral. He was promoted as a, as a rear admiral in the reserve, I believe. He, I think he went to sea as a captain. Is that right? Anyway, a wonderful Jim just loved the fact that he was being honored in the name of this uh, absolute literary giant and uh, who's, uh, you know, and uh, is, is a great name to have you have, have associated with yours. Uh, Jim was no Morrison, but he was, a, he was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Colgate who loved the military and loved to tell its story. Uh, and he did tell the story in uh, the five, uh, one, two, three, four, five books that he wrote fully about, the, uh, uh, about World War II and the, and the newest one about the Cold War, and also a book that, that, that he co-wrote with Marcus Luttrell, uh, with the, probably one of the more famous Navy SEALs. I'll touch on him a little bit later. but. Uh, let, let, let's move on to the next uh, thing where, where Jim actually talks about, uh, about his books. So the four books have traced um, sort of an accidental quartet covering the you know, different high points of the Navy's experience in World War II. The first book is a battle narrative focused 75% of the last stand of the Ten Sailors focuses on a three hour, three hour long sea battle. Basically, it's an upset victory along the lines of your local high school football team upset, upsetting Tom Brady's Patriots. <laughs> That's really what it was, the Battle of San Martin, October 25th, 1944. The next book, Ship of Ghosts, was a ship's history focused on the story of the ordeal of, of one heavy cruiser that Houston lost early in the war, a crew taken into captivity, um, deprivation on the Burma Thailand death railway for three and a half years, that Ship of Ghosts. And my last two books were campaign narratives that have become successfully larger in scope and more ambitious. Neptune's Inferno is about the Guadalcanal Canal campaign, and the fleet of flood tides about the Marianas and what was sprung from it. Um, and then the last uh, little reading, as I mentioned before, is gonna, will, will, will be about the, uh, about the dropping of the, about the atomic bomb. You know, there's been a lot of uh, controversy in some ways about the morality of all this. I, uh, Jim had some, uh, I'll, well, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let Jim tell the story. August 9th. Uh, that's, a, that's a date, along with many others, in, in connection with the Pacific War that should not be forgotten as the date of the Nagasaki bombing. Um, I don't write as an editorialist, uh, but a big part of the purpose of the Fleet of Flood Tide was to bring people back to 1945 and to make them feel what the war felt like, not only to the people on the front, but also to the home front, to make people understand the political climate of the time and the circumstances which made it uh, morally defensible to drop two atomic bombs on a, uh, on a non-uniformed population in order to end a war. And so it's a moral question that you can debate, but I think it's best understood by going back, by doing what Admiral Morrison did and going back, and projecting the sympathetic imagination, which he didn't have to do it, he was there. But the way I do what Morrison did is I try to project a sympathetic imagination back into the time and understand what events look like for the people who lived lived through these experiences. So that's the fleet of flood tide. But today is, is August 9th, and it's worth considering uh, the thesis that at no point prior to the explosion of the second atomic bomb was Japan ready to surrender. The bomb, both bombs were tragic necessities, and that the moral um, accusation for their use should fall upon the leadership of Japan and nowhere else in 1945. And if you acquaint yourself with, um, with what the deliberations were at, at Imperial General Headquarters, at Naval General Staff, and in the, and in the um, uh, Emperor Hirohito's uh, parlors, 
it's hard to avoid any conclusion but that there would have been no Japanese capitulation in uh, the summer of 1945 without uh, both atomic bombs. And the alternatives were, were grim indeed. The Navy's preferred alternative was blockade and bombardment. We don't need to drop any bomb. The Navy has control of the seas. Let's just choke Japan to death. They'll surrender at some point. They'll come to their senses. Well, that's, a, that's morally preferable to two atomic bombs. I'm not so sure. What does that blockade lead to? It leads to famine. It leads to death on a mass scale. So there are no easy answers, all which is to say I'm not up here preaching. But it's to, again, understand the choices that were available to leaders in the time, in the circumstances in which they lived, and based on the knowledge that they had at the time. Uh, a political insight that I got really after the book came out, a wonderful book um, called Implacable Foes was published. I was able to review this book uh, when it came out. But it looks at Truman's domestic political uh, situation, not to become a, make this into a seminar. But consider the, the period of the political pressure created by victory in Europe. Everyone thinks well, my simplistic military operational <laughs> interest leads me to believe that as of May 1945, after Hitler surrenders, all the military power from Europe goes to the Pacific and we invade Japan. They, have, they don't have a chance. But that's far from the way it looked at the White House. With VE Day, the political pressure arose to, and to bring the boys home as soon as possible. All these veteran sergeants who landed at Anzio and marched up Italy and all the way up into the underbelly of the, the Reich um, had some scars to show for their labors, and the political pressure to bring them home was, was insurmountable. And so General Marshall devised a point system. And at the time we were planning to invade Japan, we're in the process of discharging all of our best and most experienced soldiers, sailors, and airmen. How can we pull this thing off? It might even fail at the beach. The intelligence estimates were flawed. You know, the Japanese had with, uh, many more kamikaze aircraft than we ever thought. The realization dawns upon General MacArthur's staff as the weeks go by through July of 1945. So I had to reckon with all this in this book. It, 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 was, uh, it's, it was easily the most ambitious of the four, and uh, it brought me face to face with a moral question that's very apt uh, to raise in, on this date in particular. But it did leave us remember the date, August 15th. Remember, say a little prayer that Peridito had the wisdom and the courage to throw in the towel against the will of his top generals and admirals, of his war council, of his policy making body, uh, and, and, uh, and against the weight of all Japanese political tradition that the, that the emperor saw fit to go on the radio and address his nation and say that, you know, because of this bomb, specifically citing the bomb, to save humanity, we will surrender. Now he was, you know, fancying himself as a savior at this point. But whatever it took, you know, my, my, my point is, whatever it took to give Japan the dignity to say, we can fight no more. And that ended the war short of a famine in Japan, short of hundreds of thousands of more death, deaths on the Asian mainland. You, not, not even to mention, you know, this, number three on this list are US deaths along the way. So uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject to contemplate. It's, it's where my journey of, of uh, research and personal interest led me, beginning with this humble battle narrative to a couple of campaign narratives to the, to the thunderous end of the war itself. It's a great honor to receive the award. It's, it's wonderful that it converges on this date so we can um, talk about that theme, and consider uh, what, world, uh, what, what world our victorious um, so-called greatest generation uh, has bequeathed to us. And here we are today. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, so let's get down. So the war ends, and uh, that then leads us to um, to what happens back in the homeland after the war is over. And I'm going to turn it back to Chris to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, some of the conflicts in in Washington. So you'd think after this uh, wonderful victory, things would be all roses. However. What Jim really dives into the background of a lot of the internal politics and diplomacy that went on, um, and he picks it up right from the start of his book. Uh, the war hadn't even officially ended at this point when the branches of the U.S. military started jockeying for a hierarchy in a what would be a post-war administration. And Jim writes, at the urging of Truman, and with the full support of the War Department, the Senate was considering a bill to unify the Navy and War Departments, along with a new department designating the Air Force as a single administrative entity, 
S-2044 would put the tripartite Pentagon under the leadership of a single Secretary of Common Defense and deprive the Secretaries of War and the Navy of their long-standing membership in the President's Cabinet. The push for change had begun the day before Germany surrendered on May 7, 1945, when the Army's top civilian administrator, Secretary of War, Henry L. Stimson, wrote Secretary Forrestal to argue that the two departments should be unified, with one powerful secretary supervising the entire defense establishment. Simpson, Stimson said, there would come a windfall of savings. The principle is settled. The problem is merely to achieve the most effective possible execution of an established policy. I think it will be our duty to report that belief to the Congress in the earnest hope that your department can come along then or later with a concurring view. But Forrestal thought the service heads, Congress, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff should take the time to absorb more carefully the lessons of the Second World War, which at the time had yet to be won. That was where the matter lay until August, when the twin flashes of atomic light destroyed Japan in a war-making power, as a war-making power. Truman never stopped thinking about the implications of the new weapon. It promised to change everything. The chiefs of the U.S. Army, who relished the atomic bomb's transformative power, were using the revolution in atomic weapons to make some startling pronouncements. The leaders of the strategic air forces in particular wasted no time advancing their sweeping claim to primacy based on their exclusive capacity to deliver atomic weapons across the oceans. The bombs ended one war and started another. In the offices of Congress and in the angled corridors of the Pentagon, the longest running civil war in American life flared anew. The quest of generals and admirals to bring the other service to heel. And in November, General Dwight D. Eisenhower had stunned the Navy leadership by telling the Senate Military Affairs Committee that a merger would have saved the country 25% of the $265 billion it had cost to fight the war. The Navy's budget writers considered this a lurid fantasy. I will wager that even he had no idea of the figures with which he was playing, wrote the Assistant Secretary of Navy, H. Struve Hensel, to the New York Times, which itself called Ike's numbers a flash guest. Cost savings was one angle the Army played in support of defense unification. Another claim was equally striking, that naval forces had become superfluous in winning wars. At a meeting of a Senate Special Committee on Atomic Energy in December, a senator who had been impressed by the Army's presentation said to a Navy official, Atomic energy has driven ships off the surface of the sea. I don't see how a ship can resist the atomic bomb. Even experienced warriors were joining them, including Jimmy Doolittle, the Army aviation hero who had staged the bold 1942 air raid on Tokyo that would forever bear his name. He had told a Senate subcommittee that the aircraft carrier, the most important ship in the fleet, had two notable attributes. One attribute is that it can move about. The other attribute is that it can be sunk. It is going into obsolescence. And it frothed Admiral Halsey's Irish to see colleagues turned opportunists using exotic propaganda to erode the Navy's long cherished autonomy. Now Jim maintains this, this uh, thread um, and paints well how the geopolitical and defense and technological advances uh, are needed and how they came about to help bolster the, the Navy's relevance during that time. Well, before we go on, but we're talking about all these issues that the book brings up. I, we don't have time to read all the little snippets like this, but there are a couple that I think are important. Um, and the first is that many of the geopolitical uh, diplomatic scenarios Jim covers are, are very relevant today. Um, you know, one that began right after Hiroshima is who should have access to the United States' new atomic tech. Opinions ran the gamut, as Jim had written. 
so he writes, the question posed by the atomic bomb went beyond the methods of their delivery. The question of what nation should be allowed to have them was on the table as well. Secretary of War Stimson and others believed the secret of the bomb should be shared with the allied nations. Stimson thought America had a duty to promote atomic research for peaceful application. The Secretary of Treasurer and Attorney General thought that America should keep ownership of the secret and hold it close, leverage it, and accelerate the research. But it was one thing for Washington to place such trust as an ally in the United Kingdom and Canada. Could the other nominal allied power, the Soviet Union, operate in good faith as an international order? One of the uh, major things that happened during this period, of course, was the founding of NATO, and that's certainly in the, in the forefront of what we're uh, seeing today with what's going on in the Ukraine. And uh, one, one line that Jim writes in the middle of his book on NATO, the fundamental trust issue at the heart of NATO was the question of where the alliance would finally spill blood in defense of a Soviet invasion of, at the time it was West Germany, I think you could put the word Ukraine in there today, uh, and uh, you know, and that's a he has he has a number of insightful comments about about the, about NATO and about uh, who what what war plan could, uh, could could actually utilize nuclear weapons if they could. And a lot of that really, I, I read a piece in the Wall Street Journal this past weekend or a couple of weeks ago where they were talking about what options would Putin have for ending the war in um, in the Ukraine. And uh, you know, they they say w w would a Russian leader ever accept defeat? He said this, this author, who was a, a professor at the University of Chicago and wrote a, and has written re recently on this, concluded that uh, great powers in desperate straits, desperate, desperate straits usually escalate rather than submit, as Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor showed. If pushed to the wall, Moscow would probably at least consider using its nuclear arsenal to salvage the situation. After all, that was NATO's policy during the Cold War in the event that the Warsaw Pact's conventional forces were defeating NATO's armies and threatening to overrun Western Europe. And so, you know, it, it, a lot of these issues that were existing in 60 years ago, 80 years ago, in the 1940s and 50s uh, come back today. Uh, over 100 pages of Jim's book is devoted to the, to, the Korean, to the Korean War, which began in 1950 and, didn't, and lasted until 1953 when, as, as they concluded, the three-year the three -year war was uh, ended on a, on a permanent pause. Well, that permanent pause seems to be uh, in threat of danger today, as you see what's, what, what's going on with the madmen in, in North Korea and their, and their bombs and missiles. Uh, we're, we're running a little bit long here, and so I, I think we'll uh, probably skip over one of the sections we were going to do a little bit and get back to, uh, let's see, where were we? We've got the book here. Uh, we've had, and uh, I'm going to have Chris now kind of do his f third and final reading on, uh, on, a ch on, on the chapter at the end of the book and gets to hear some of Jim's conclusions at the end of this. So Jim makes clear the point in his book, in order for the Navy to keep its rel uh, relevance, that they had to have a, a tactical and strategic place in the military. And part of that was weapons delivery. Um, he details how that mobility, stealth, and that delivery were made possible through pl brilliant planners and, and technicians throughout the decades that followed World War II to make that possible. Um, so he concludes, I'm gonna read just a few sentiments here about how Jim concludes who can hold the sea. Uh, and some of the naval milestones that ended uh, in 1960, where his book uh, concludes. The Navy's acquisition of a strategic missile component following the development of Polaris provided an impetus, an impetus to overhaul the national strategic war plan. Prior to the ballistic missile, each service had its own war plan. There was absolutely no coordination in the atomic weapons era. Uh, said Rear Admiral Kent Liston Lee. The old atomic war plan was workable as long as one service controlled the great majority of atomic warheads, as the Strategic Air Command did until 1958. With the advent of Polaris, however, 
the order of battle was to change, and single-service control of diverse land and sea-based weaponry threatened to become complex. Eisenhower directed that the services prepare to work together under a joint command. Everybody's weapons will be in one plan, the president ordered. And known as the Single Integrated Operational Plan, or more commonly, PSYOP, it was almost completely independent of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, except that they were expected to rubber stamp it whenever the commander of SAC, General Thomas Power, thought to show it to them from time to time. And while Polaris was never touted as having a tactical application, submarine development in New London had produced an attack submarine with revolutionary hull form. The submarine USS Albacore's hydrodynamically efficient teardrop hull, built with unusual features such as a fixed cruciform tail arrangement that put the control surfaces forward of the propeller, was adopted in the swift new skipjack class nuclear powered attack submarine, which was capable of underwater speeds as high as 29 knots. And as the 1950s drew to a close, the aircraft carrier had survived a revolution in weaponry that was supposed to have sent it down the road of the catapult and the longbow. Four of the new Forrestal class supercarriers were in commission, the Forrestal, Saratoga, Ranger, and Independence, and the first nuclear-powered carrier, Enterprise, and the Kitty Hawk, the lead ship of a powerful new class, were under construction. The cruisers escorting them were numerous and powerful, firing anti-aircraft missiles with a 100-mile range. But it was Polaris that changed public attitudes and strategic thinking in the Navy Department. Newspaper photos of great 14-ton missiles sprouting from the sea and taking flight atop a gaunt of smoke and a pillar of flame captured the imagination and signified the U.S. Navy's new worldwide reach. Where naval forces had prevailed over land forces, they had generally done so by virtue of mobility and stealth, so too now, except that the maritime forces had closed the gap in terms of sheer firepower as well. And on the strength of a decade's progress in technology, the service that had fought a battle for survival and then tried in vain to stop Chinese soldiers from using bridges to cross a river had now acquired a revolutionary capability in power projection. Far from Bikini and those days of sharp questioning in congressional hearing rooms, securely hidden in their secret harbors where the sun forbears to shine, the U.S. Navy's new capital ships made effective by skilled nuclear-trained engineers and technicians and equipped with megaton main batteries could shiver the foundation of the earth. At over 400 pages, you know, these snippets really just scratch the surface of the book. Like Jim's other book, it's, it's detailed, it's, it's insightful, it, it celebrates the Navy and the individuals involved in the Navy. And there are many reasons why it belongs with Jim's other books, um, other best-selling books. Uh, they're all on the must-read lists of admirals for their uh, lower officers to read. Uh, quite an accomplishment for my, my good friend. Thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> <coughs> okay, we're going to wrap up just briefly here with a little review of some of the awards that Jim received. I mentioned getting the... Uh, the highest award the Navy gives to a civilian is Distinguished Public Service Award, which he received, uh, signed by the Secretary of the Navy uh, just before he passed away. Uh, Jim is buried in this beautiful high honor cemetery in Austin, Texas, uh, where you have to apply to, to get in. He said writing, he and his wife had to write the, uh, write the request, and he uh, was quite the, quite, quite the challenge to do when you're suffering from, from brain cancer in the last days of your life. So. It was uh, that in itself was probably Jim's final <laughs> final piece of writing, in a, in a sort of a sad, morose sort of way. Uh, but he kind of knew where he was going, and he's going to be uh, wonderfully enough buried next to uh, Marcus Luttrell, the the Navy SEAL who uh, who wrote uh, who wrote a book which became the a, a very famous movie 
Um, and uh, that's a book called Service There. When, when Luttrell went back to, uh, after his service in Afghanistan, he, he went back and served in Iraq. And so Jim and, and the Luttrell brothers became very close together. So it's a great honor to have for Jim and Marcus to know that they will, uh, they will be resting together. Um, I, I mentioned Jim sports fan a little bit. Uh, you know, you can take the boy out of Boston, but you can't take the Boston out of the boy. In one of the quotes, Jim mentioned that all of his children were all brought up the right way despite living in Texas. Uh, he, and uh, Ann Keene, a writer in Texas who wrote a wonderful book on Ted Williams' service in the military, uh, uh, arranged after Jim's death to have this uh, lovely posting put up at Fenway Park on their, uh, on their, on their, on their wall. And this, again, is, the, uh, is a piece of the, uh, is the uh, plaque I began the talk with that, that sits, on a, uh, sits on a bench in the lovely new Veterans Memorial Park in Framingham on Concord Street. You should get down there. The city of Framingham Parks and Rec Department, along with some heroic work by uh, Policeman Downing and others, did a great job in restoring this, this beautiful park, and we were honored to be a part of it. And uh, in bricks surrounding Jim's bench uh, name all of his books and uh, where they and, uh, and give a brief summary. So if you get a chance to go there, it's a, it's a wonderful place to honor all of our servicemen. And uh, that's a little memorial we have at home next to some of Elsa's beautiful stained glass with Jim's books and honors and picture uh, that brings us clo closer to us every day. And uh, finally, the uh, Wall Street Journal had this wonderful uh, obituary book review, I guess you could call it, by Alex Kershaw, who is a great military writer. If you have a chance to read some of his stuff, it, it's terrific. Uh, and Kershaw wrote this, uh, this wonderful thing and concludes, Hornfisher was an indispensable historian of the Navy. And that brings us to, to, to the end of the formal piece of our, of our presentation. Uh, we'll uh, turn it over to any questions and answers any of you might have. It's been a little long of, of presentation. I hope you enjoyed Chris's readings and um, the comments that, that we've made. So uh, this is being broadcast on, uh, on YouTube, so I will repeat any questions that you have so they can be heard. But uh, uh, please don't ask us to, for questions about whether it was an SR-42 or an SR-41 that was fired into the middle of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that's not Chris and I's our expertise. But I, I, I will just add one comment about Jim. When the most frequently asked, well, two questions he was asked most frequently. Well, one is, how did you get to be such a naval, famous naval historian? And uh, we always said that, you know, it started when at, at age 10, I'm sitting on the couch one night and he comes down with a piece of paper. He says, Dad, I want to join a book club. And I'm thinking he wants to join the Red Sox fan club or something. And I look at the book uh, thing and it's to join the military history club. And uh, that was kind of, a, kind of a leading indicator. And another question he got says, well, what, what audience are you writing for? And he said, well, that's my challenge. He says, on one hand, I want my mother to be able to understand what I'm writing, but I don't want to offend any admirals or seamen. And uh, as Chris noted before, uh, his, he, he really valued the comments and the stories of seamen. The, one of the books uh, on, the, uh, on, on the battle at the USS San Francisco in one of the battles, he quotes heavily from the cook, who was the guy that probably knew the admiral best. And they, they kind of went down together. And, it, and that's a beautiful story in that book. But anyway, I, I answered the first two questions that I usually get, so I'll leave you to the tough ones. <laughs> yes, sir. Tony. Well, I think you'll have to read Who Can Hold the Sea. That gets you up to 1960. Uh, he, was, he, had, he had been contracted to write two more books on the Cold War from 1960 to 1975 and then 1975 to the fall of the wall in uh, Berlin Wall in 1990. Unfortunately, those two will have to reside in his, his notes have all been donated to the uh, Nimitz Museum in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas, where they have a lovely memorial on his behalf as well. But, uh, you know, uh, Jim, uh, Jim w was frequently talked to by military people today. I remember him be get getting asked to go talk to the Secretary of the Navy a couple years ago, and the Secretary was particularly interested in, in Jim's insights onto, uh, on, onto, the, onto fuel storage. And, uh, you know, running ships takes enormous amounts of oil and gas or whatever the technology is to, to run them. And so, uh, you know, the Secretary of the Navy wondered, wanted to hear from a historian how this was handled in, in World War II. Uh, I wish I could give you a better answer, but I'm, Jim's not here. <laughs> One of the uh, chapters he has is dedicated um, to the first nuclear submarine that eventually went under the ice shelf, the North, North uh, Pole ice shelf. Um, 
And when I, when I visited Jim a couple months before his passing, uh, it just <laughs> happened a two-star admiral stopped by, uh, Admiral, uh, Rear Admiral Ted LeClerc, who was uh, partly in charge of the Indo-Pacific uh, protection and, and surveillance. Uh, and it was amazing just to hear him and uh, to, he and Jim talk about uh, some of the, the strategy that they're employing to keep China in check and knowing exactly where they're, uh, where they are and, and how they're. Yeah. And so I think um, as he ends this book with the fact that um, they were able, the Navy was able to prove its, its mobility, its, its silence, its weapons delivery, um, and its ability to go undetected silently all over the globe um, as a watchdog. Kind of cements its place. And yes, yeah, so, Carol. I have two questions. Um, first of all, there are so many people that were in combat and in wars that came back, particularly from World War II, that you never wanted to talk about. And how <laughs> did they, the researchers, historian, and archivist, get a hold of these people who do tell their story? I mean, clearly, he had a very good. That's a terrific question, Carol, about the, uh, about, about the survivors and not wanting to talk about the war when they got home. Uh, probably the most poignant one is, as I mentioned, the story of James Bradley, uh, who didn't really know that his father was one of the flag raisers until he happened to be up in the attic and going through his father's boxes of, 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 of mementos, and he found all this stuff. And, um, and, you know, his father, I think it was after his father had passed even, and the family didn't really know a lot about this. And uh, in, in Jim's first book, uh, the Tin Can Sailor book, he was, uh, he, he was able to speak to a, to a few of the survivors themselves. And many of them told him that this is the first time I'm telling anybody the story of what I went through. Because, you know, war is hell, they, they, they said, and it really is when you talk to people who were there. And uh, these people, uh, these, these, these survivors, in many cases, were just so uh, taken by, by what had happened to them, whether it's PTSD, as it's called today, or other stuff, that they, that they just didn't want to talk about it. But they became, as they met Jim and understood that he was serious about what he was doing, that he was respectful of, of them, they, they opened up to him. And uh, he, goes to, he, he went to a lot of ship reunions where, where these people or their children w would be present. And uh, one person looked at him and, and, couldn't, and thought that, uh, uh, I think I was with them one time, and they thought that I was the historian. They said the historian couldn't be such a young man as Jim. <laughs> but uh, but, but the, the, your, your point, Carol, about people not wanting to tell the story is, it, was something that, that he, had to, he had to deal with, and uh, I think his style and his, his ability to do that, I think, is one of the great, really, really contributed to, to his success. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Hmm. Um. Yes, sir. What do you think Jim would have thought of the weakness we have in our military today compared to a few years ago? Yeah, Jim's thinking about, about the military today was uh, he, he, he was quite concerned about it. He would often uh, comment on that, and uh, he felt that the, uh, you know, the Navy was being shortchanged and many of the financial decisions being made in Washington. And uh, uh, many of his books get to sort of a conflict between the uh, the, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Navy, even in terms of uh, terms of in terms of dealing with with belligerent countries and stuff like that. But he would be quite upset by it. Would to be the short answer to your question. I wish I could give you a better, more specific answer, but uh, um, he 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 definitely had that feeling, and that's why many of the admirals, like uh, uh, Chris mentioned, uh, were uh, eager to eager to speak to him because they they thought that he could have been a I think, you know, we lost a son, I lost a great friend, but I think the military lost a great advocate. And in many ways, as much as I almost cry when I think of the other two, I, I think that's probably an even bigger loss. And uh, uh, because Jim got it, he really did. He, he, uh, he was able to express in words people would understand and in words that the military would respect. And uh, as, he, as, he, as he quoted, uh, Morrison saying that you know when you when you have a lot of knowledge of something, simplicity is 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 the true art to make it happen. And uh, 
I think Jim, Jim was really able to, able to do that. Our, our family is not a military family. Uh, a couple of my uncles and cousins were, were, were in the military, but we, we don't really have a deep military tradition in our family. Uh, but Jim, when he was thinking of going to college, we, we took him up to West Point to see the school up there, and he spent a day with the cadets at West Point and came home and said, I'm not going there. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but, but, but then he was, in the, uh, he was in the Colgate band his first day as a freshman, and, um, and Colgate beat Army, so that was his. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, Jim's good friend in the audience here is, is Ted Price, who was a, one of Jim's best friends from Colgate. Uh, Jim, Jim really had three brothers in life, we said, uh, other, than, other than a sister. Well, he actually had four in, 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 in one respect. He had his first brother was Chris, uh, was, was, was Marty Ross in Amherst, who, who is now very involved in, in military st stuff and working in a defense contractor. Then in Litchfield, Connecticut, he had Chris Newton, and then at Colgate, he, he met Ted Price, and Ted and Chris even lived with Jim at different parts of his, his stays in New York before he moved, moved on to Texas. His fourth brother was an international student, Dirk uh, Veniger, who uh, lived with us for a year when, when, uh, when Jim was a senior in high school. So, um, so he, he was very lucky to have these, these people in his life. And a shout out to them if they're watching on YouTube. <laughs> yes, sir. Questions about whether Jim had any connection to the Merchant Marines. I'm sad to say that I can't add anything to that, to, to that question. I don't recall Jim mentioning that, and I don't know personally enough about what the Merchant Marines do. I know he, re, I know he was very respectful of all, of all branches of the service and, um, and the Coast Guard and, 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 and everybody else who puts their, puts their body in harm's way in, in any way. And he, he, he would often speak of that in a kind of a general way. So I'm sure he would have had great respect for it, but I'm, I'm afraid I can't give you a, a better answer than what you missed the opportunity to get <laughs> yourself anyway. Well, we got time for about one or two more if anybody has uh, any questions. Uh, yes, again, Carol. Where was he? Where, that, 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 that too is a good question as to why he chose to focus on the Navy instead of the Army or the Marines. Uh, I, I think number one, he felt in many cases the Navy got shortchanged by historians. We, we see a lot of movies about Private Ryan and a lot of other things uh, honoring, honoring the Marines and things of that nature. And so that, that was one thing, that, that's one fact that earned him a lot of respect from, from Navy people. From his youngest days, um, Elsa and I can remember seeing his room and his bedroom filled with Revell model airplanes flying around and, the sh and, and plastic ships on his dresser, all pointed in the right direction, watching, uh, watching Pappy Boyington and uh, some of the other military shows on TV in the 1970s. Um, and uh, the, his first book, The, the well, Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors, was a story that he when he, when, he, when he told us that, you know, I've been representing other people, I want to write a book now myself. And I said, well, what are you going to choose to write about? And he said, well, one of the stories that, that, that I've loved ever since I was a kid was this David and Goliath story where America gets to be David for once. And, and these, small, these small destroyers hold off the entire Japanese fleet in the, in the Pacific and really turn the war around and save, and save MacArthur's lives and, his, and his, his, his position in the Philippines. So that was a key thing. Um, do you have any further insight into that, Chris? Uh, uh, all I know, when I first met Jim, uh, we were 12. <laughs> and, you know, I walked into his bedroom and I saw all of the Navy planes hanging from his ceiling and all of the, uh, the uh, Revell ships built. And, you know, took his, what did I walk into here? <laughs> and, and soon after that, I just, it just, was, it was his love and his passion. And he, it was, you know, shortly after that, he, you know, you saw a picture of us playing Risk up there, but one of his other favorite games to play uh, with me was a board game of the Battle of Midway. 
<laughs> and uh, once in a while, he, he would even let me be the United States. <laughs> so, um, for some reason, the, the Navy was uh, always came, came to the forefront for him. And, you know, my father served uh, on a destroyer escort in the Navy in World War II. And when, you know, my dad would be out and back having a, having a, a Miller's after a hard day work, and Jim would come over and I thought he was going to play with me, but he just wanted to talk to my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, uh, you know, you shouldn't be jealous of your dad at 12. <laughs> uh, for as far as long as I've known him, that passion for the Navy has always been there. Mm. Well, thank you. I, I hope this hasn't gone on too long. Uh, we, there was a lot, uh, lot to be said. There's a lot in these books. I hope I've encouraged some of you to uh, pick up and read them on YouTube, on uh, <laughs> on uh, Amazon or in the library or at, at your local Barnes & Noble or what other small bookstores are around. They're, they're not a book you can sit down and read in one hour. I'll tell you, after I read one chapter, I'm kind of done. Uh, it, it's uh, the intensity, the facts, the, the stuff that's in there. I've often said to both my wife, Elsa had a column in the newspaper and I've done a lot of writing and we're both pretty good writers, but when I see a sentence sometimes that Jim wrote, like the slippery steel or something, and some of the phrases that Chris read, I say, you know, I could no more ski the Matterhorn than I could have written that sentence. So, so thank you for joining me in this tribute to Jim tonight. It, it's meant a lot for, for, for me to be able to develop it and to have so many family, friends, and even people I, I, I don't know in the audience tonight. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, God bless you all. <laughs>so much to Dave. Thank you to Chris. Thank you to friends and family who are here tonight. New folks who are here tonight, folks at home. We're so thrilled that you were able to join us for this wonderful and really meaningful event. Uh, we would encourage you to please fill out our evaluation form in the back. Let, you know, let us know what you thought about it. And if you'd like to join our mailing list, check out some of our other great programs. We've got flyers in the back. And if you are interested in Jim's book, we do have copies here at the library, or like Dave said, you can check them out on Amazon or at your local Barnes & Noble. Thank you again for being here tonight. I almost forgot, tonight's program has been recorded. So if you know anybody who would like to attend and who wasn't able to be there tonight, have them stop by the Framingham Public Library YouTube page. You'll find tonight's recording. We're also working with Access Framingham to air a showing of it later as well. I don't have a date on that, so in the meantime, send them to the Framingham Library YouTube page.